I'm Rick Lifton, the president of Rockefeller University, and I am delighted to welcome you to another in our series on uh, virtual discussions with genuine experts. Uh, and the topic uh, this afternoon is fighting COVID-19 with uh, antibody therapy. And we have a uh, world expert in this, uh, world leader in this field, Michelle Nussenzweig, as our discussant uh, this afternoon. Today is a propitious day uh, for a number of reasons. And I'll uh, simply uh, begin uh, by noting that uh, earlier today, uh, one of our Rockefeller faculty, uh, Dr. Charles Rice, uh, received the Nobel Prize in Medicine. Uh, he was presented the award today at the uh, uh, Swedish Ambassador's Residence uh, here in uh, New York City, uh, and he's here with the uh, ambassador receiving his prize with the medallion uh, uh, and its tribute to uh, Charlie in the lower right-hand uh, corner of the slide. Uh, this is our third Nobel Prize in Medicine in the last 10 years. Uh, and our 27th overall, which is a remarkable uh, series of accomplishments. So congratulations uh, to Charlie. We all are extraordinarily proud uh, to be a colleague of his here at Rockefeller. So when we started this series uh, now uh, uh, more than eight months ago, our first uh, uh, in the series was on April 7th, and uh, we were speculating at that time about potential courses uh, for the pandemic. And there were several possible uh, ways the pand pandemic might uh, unfold. Uh, one was that uh, the virus, if we controlled it early, uh, could simply go away and never come back. A second possibility would be if we did nothing, the uh, curve might just take off and continue going up and up. Uh, and a third was that if we did a good job of uh, uh, fighting the virus, uh, but did so a little later, uh, we might be able to fight the virus off, but it might subsequently come back uh, and uh, do uh, serious damage later on. Uh, this, of course, is a course that's similar to what happened with the flu pandemic uh, in 1918 uh, that ravaged the world and uh, took millions of lives uh, worldwide. So we had no idea what the actual uh, course would be, and uh, we've learned a lot more about that course uh, over the last eight months. Uh, and in fact, uh, it turns out that uh, there are different uh, countries that have had different experiences with the virus as a consequence uh, that uh, demonstrate these different patterns. China was where the uh, virus originated and hit uh, very hard there in Wuhan and spreading out uh, from there. Uh, but China was incredibly aggressive in uh, their containment efforts, very successful in uh, virtually eradicating the infection uh, from uh, the, the Chinese population. And there have been occasional cases that have been dealt with swiftly, uh, but they've remained uh, essentially free of the virus over the last uh, seven months. Uh, in contrast, uh, France was successful. They had a, a, a modest uh, uh, initial episode. Uh, we're able to fight that off. Uh, but then at the end of the beginning, the end of the summer and subsequently had a dramatic resurgence uh, of the virus uh, that uh, uh, led to a very large number of cases uh, in France. Uh, but they went through, again, severe measures to constrain the virus and have been able to fight down the uh, uh, number of cases uh, once again. Uh, in contrast, uh, Sweden uh, has made taken a different approach. They haven't tried as hard to uh, uh, con contain the virus. They've tried to protect uh, the elderly population, but have tried to uh, keep uh, life uh, relatively normal uh, otherwise. Uh, and as a consequence, they've had prolonged uh, episodes of the virus uh, circulating uh, at reasonably high levels, had a pretty good uh, summer, but now are back uh, and have a dramatic rise in cases that have not yet uh, been mitigated. And uh, these cases are now higher than they've been uh, in, through at any period in uh, Sweden's experience. And then we hit the United States, which has followed a course, although we have tried uh, uh, with some fits and starts to constrain the virus in different locales. Uh, we have uh, had a course where we have never really eradicated the virus or gotten it to exceptionally low levels across the country. We had a wave in the summer that went back down and now we've seen a steady rise uh, where the number of cases of the virus have dramatically increased in recent weeks uh, and are now over 200,000 cases uh, per day uh, ac ac across the country cumulatively. 
So globally, uh, we've seen a continued rise. It's heterogeneous across the globe. We're now over 68 million cases worldwide with uh, uh, as an average of more than 600,000 cases uh, per day with uh, 11,000 uh, deaths per day uh, worldwide. Uh, and uh, there's heterogeneity across uh, the world. Uh, this is what uh, it looked like at our last webinar in October, uh, where the scale was there was nobody who had more than about uh, 15 cases per 100,000 population per week. Uh, and uh, that has changed dramatically over the uh, last several months to a map uh, that looks uh, now like this where uh, the, the scale is dramatically different. Now 68 uh, cases uh, uh, per 100,000 uh, per day uh, in over the previous seven days uh, is now the new upper limit of the scale. And the United States is right near the tip of uh, that scale with only a handful of countries such as uh, uh, Serbia uh, and Lithuania uh, and Sweden rivaling us for the highest number of cases per capita on a daily basis. It continues to be the case that Africa has been largely spared, Southeast uh, uh, Asia has been largely spared uh, as well uh, for reasons that are still not well understood. Uh, there's suspicion that this might be in part attributable to uh, exposure to many other uh, related viruses that uh, might give partial immunity, but we really don't know the uh, explanation for that uh, at, at this point. So this shows uh, the pattern of new diagnosis and deaths uh, in the United States. As I indicated, uh, there are now uh, more than uh, 200,000 uh, cases uh, per day uh, and the number of deaths has uh, followed. It is not the case that this is a, a disease that uh, is without consequence. Uh, we hit once again, uh, uh, 3,000 cases, uh, 3,000 deaths uh, yesterday for the first time since uh, uh, much earlier in the pandemic. Uh, and we're well over 2,000 cases per day. And lest we think uh, nonetheless that this is not a dramatic impact uh, on the general population, uh, we have, uh, we can see that there's, while there's heterogeneity, well, I'll move to the next slide. Uh, last week, COVID-19 became the leading cause of death uh, in the United States, surpassing deaths due to uh, heart, heart attack and ischemic heart disease, uh, lung cancer, and others. Uh, and that's only going up. There will likely be more than 14,000 deaths uh, from COVID uh, this week. Uh, so this is obviously quite uh, uh, dramatic. It is also the case that uh, the map of the ca new cases across the United States uh, while there's still regional variation, uh, it's become much more homogeneous than it used to be. As you'll recall, early on, it was confined to the Northeast and parts of uh, the West Coast. Then last uh, uh, summer, it was in the uh, uh, in spring in the Southern states, then evolved to much more Midwest and Upper Midwest. Uh, and now it's uh, filling in across the country and is quite dramatic uh, in most locations, although there is uh, some regional variation. Uh, this is uh, data for New York City, demonstrating that uh, we've gone from a low level in uh, uh, the summer and uh, early fall, and we've been increasing uh, uh, substantially since then. We're now at about 3,000 new cases per day uh, across the city, uh, with about 140 new hospitalizations and about two, 22 deaths per day uh, from uh, COVID-19. Uh, it's notable that uh, our hospitalization rate is significantly lower than uh, it, it was uh, previously. I hope we're able to hang on to that. And the death rate uh, is uh, much lower uh, than it was previously as well, because we have not been overrun with uh, the virus the way we were in uh, March and April. And as a consequence, our healthcare system uh, has been doing a superb job of managing uh, the cases that have come in. And we've learned a lot about how to manage uh, patients who need to be hospitalized for COVID-19. So what uh, also makes today a propitious day is the hearing that is going on today at the FDA uh, to evaluate registration of uh, the first drug uh, to get uh, uh, potentially get uh, an emergency use authorization uh, in the United States. 
So uh, we've shown previously the life cycle of the virus. The virus enters the cell from specific uh, cell surface receptor called ACE2 on uh, epithelial cells. Uh, and it gets in through a particular protein called spike protein that binds to uh, this receptor that gains an en entrance uh, into the cell and then enables the RNA encoded in the genome of the virus uh, to be translated into the proteins that uh, are needed for making new viruses that then escape uh, the cell. So all of the vaccines uh, that uh, are in production at this point and being in development uh, are targeting the spike protein, which is used to gain entry uh, into the cell. And all are trying to block uh, this first step in uh, the viral life cycle of gaining entry uh, into the cell. There are different approaches to uh, vaccination, which uh, uh, has uh, each has its own strengths and some uh, uh, weaknesses. Uh, and amazingly, there's been just a remarkable effort uh, by industry to develop uh, these new vaccines. Uh, by last count, there are 144 different vaccines in both either preclinical or clinical development. Uh, 58 of these have advanced into the clinical development uh, phase. Uh, and these take different approaches. Uh, the, probably the most time-honored uh, approach to uh, vaccination is uh, uh, preparing large quantities of uh, the virus and then inactivating it chemically uh, with uh, either formaldehyde or uh, beta propionic uh, acid. Uh, and this is an approach that has been taken by several uh, uh, efforts that are underway in China. Uh, another approach is to simply make uh, the spike protein itself in large quantity and administer uh, the protein itself uh, into the body to try to elicit uh, an effective immune response uh, to uh, just the spike protein itself. There are also engineered uh, viruses that, uh, such as adenoviruses that are engineered to contain uh, the gene encoding the spike protein. Uh, the advantages of this is uh, uh, that uh, you can make these uh, fairly readily and, and quite inexpensively, uh, which has a huge advantage as we think about trying to vaccinate uh, the world. Uh, the downside is once you've been exposed to the adenovirus, uh, you can mount an immune response to the adenovirus. And so when you give, for example, a booster dose, as many of these vaccines, in fact, uh, most of those in production now and uh, for evaluation and clinical trials, uh, need two doses of vaccine. So if, the, if you're introducing a virus that you can mount an immune response to, you can see that you might get diminishing returns as you give second and if necessary, third or fourth doses uh, of uh, the virus because the immune system recognizes the virus and before the virus can infect cells and start making the spike protein uh, from the gene that's encoded in the uh, viral genome, uh, you might uh, have already uh, eliminated the virus. There are also naked DNA viruses that uh, have been engineered to include the uh, spike protein and uh, sequences responsible for expressing uh, the uh, uh, spike protein uh, from the uh, DNA. And then there are RNA virus, uh, RNA uh, vectors. And these RNA uh, uh, vaccines are fascinating in that uh, they only include the messenger RNA that encodes the spike protein and they're enveloped uh, in a lipid uh, uh, molecule of, uh, uh, ver that includes various different uh, uh, fatty acid moieties uh, that enable it to uh, get into cells uh, and then allow the RNA to be translated into uh, uh, protein. So these are the first to hit the finish line and we now have uh, under review today uh, one RNA vaccine and next week will be a second RNA vaccine uh, that is being evaluated for emergency use authorization. So the way these work is these RNAs, because of their uh, lipid uh, uh, envelope, are able to fuse with the cellular membrane and get entrance into the cell. Uh, and then the RNA is released and that RNA gets translated into the spike protein, which can be uh, put on the cell surface. Fragments of the spike protein can be shown by the histocompatibility locus that uh, can, all of these can be effective to uh, enable B cells to interact with them, enable T cells to interact with them and uh, stimulate uh, production of antibodies by B cells that specifically recognize uh, the spike protein. 
Uh, and th this then mounts an immune response that enables that to, to bind the virus and prevent the virus from infecting cells. And the tail end of the antibodies are capable of attracting other immune cells that uh, can also destroy the virus. So this is the mechanism by which uh, these uh, RNA vaccines are uh, thought to work. And I'll present now the data that uh, the FDA is evaluating today for the first to hit the finish line uh, with a successful phase three clinical trial. And this is the RNA vaccine uh, supported by Pfizer that was developed by uh, the BioNTech uh, biotech company in Germany. So they randomized 44,000 subjects to either the vaccine or placebo. Uh, they gave two doses, uh, 21 days apart. Subjects were recruited mostly from the US, but uh, also subjects from Brazil, Argentina, Germany, South Africa, and Turkey. Uh, they uh, covered a range of uh, ages. Uh, varied ethnicities were represented as well. Uh, and the goal of the uh, trial was to compare the number of symptomatic infections uh, that occurred seven days or later after the second dose of the uh, vaccine. They also need to document safety and they evaluated adverse event events at a median of two, mo two months uh, after the second dose and evaluated all the results when uh, at least 170 symptomatic cases uh, had been accrued in the total trial. This was a blinded trial, so nobody knew who got the vaccine or placebo until this uh, total of 170 cases uh, was reached, at which point uh, everything was unblinded and analyzed, or at least the cases were unblinded and analyzed. And this shows the results. So uh, this first is the demographics of people who are randomized for study, and you want to make sure that uh, they're well balanced between the people who got the vaccine and the people who received the placebo. Uh, and men and women were e evenly distributed between the two groups. Uh, there were uh, individuals of different ages that were well matched between the two groups, 16 to 55, greater than 55 people more than 65 years of age and more than 75 years of age, there was only a, a much smaller number, uh, but they were still in the study and uh, people were matched across uh, ethnicity as well. And so this is the uh, top line result of uh, the study. Out of the 170 cases, uh, which were very well matched uh, for the length of exposure after the uh, uh, period of uh, vaccination, there were 162 of those 170 cases were in placebo and only eight were in the cases. So compared to expectation, uh, there, was, there were only 5% as many cases in uh, uh, the uh, vaccinated group compared to the placebo group, uh, indicating an efficacy of the vaccine of 95%. Uh, and this uh, seemed to work uh, very well, both among people uh, 16 to 55, as well as people greater than uh, 55 years uh, of age. And uh, moreover, if you look at this uh, uh, more closely, there weren't uh, terribly many cases in people over age 65 or over age 75. Uh, but again, there continued to be a striking imbalance uh, between cases and controls. There were co comorbidities uh, such as, uh, as uh, type 2 diabetes uh, mellitus, cardiovascular disease, and so forth. Uh, and people who had uh, serious co comorbidities constituted a large fraction of patients, and they seemed to be uh, as well uh, protected as people who did not have uh, pre existing uh, comorbidities. Importantly, uh, it appears that although the data is sparse, uh, the severe uh, COVID-19 requiring hospitalization and in some cases uh, intensive care unit uh, uh, experiences uh, also seem to be protected uh, by the vaccine with an imbalance of nine in cases and only one uh, severe case, uh, only one severe case uh, in the vaccinated group uh, compared to nine in the placebo group. This shows the overall curve of the accrual of cases. And you can see from the starting time, 
Cases were evenly distributed between cases and controls uh, in the uh, first week and a half of the trial, uh, but uh, very quickly departed. And this is the curve for the people who got the vaccine and the curve for the uh, placebo group, which is pretty much a straight line all the way out. But you can see that after a week and a half, even before people got the second dose, uh, this was separating, indicating that there was partial uh, protection from uh, just the first dose of vaccine. Uh, and uh, very few cases uh, occurring, uh, as noted, after uh, at least a week after the second dose uh, of vaccine. So this is what uh, an efficacious uh, trial looks like. And uh, I think it's extremely likely that uh, on the basis of efficacy, this would be uh, registered. Uh, also on uh, safety side, uh, safety was, uh, there was very little uh, uh, safety signal from in the two month uh, follow up uh, that was obtained uh, thus far uh, with people getting uh, reactions at the injection site. Uh, people uh, developing, in some cases, fever and fatigue that uh, uh, in virtually all cases went away uh, very quickly and there was very little uh, concern about safety. But this is in a closely watched uh, phase three clinical trial that typically recruits healthy people to try to diminish uh, the uh, uh, events that would be concerning uh, that might be expected to occur uh, in an ill population, uh, even without getting the vaccine. And to that point, in just the first day of administration of the vaccine in uh, Britain, where it was approved a few days ago, uh, there have been two uh, anaphylactic uh, reactions among people who have a history of anaphylaxis and carry EpiPens with them uh, wherever they go uh, because of these extreme allergic reactions that they uh, can sometimes experience to bee stings uh, uh, and other exposures. So uh, this indicates that uh, real world experience may differ from the uh, uh, very careful uh, confines of a phase three clinical trial. Other phase three clinical trials have uh, been reported uh, and uh, uh, a few of these have been published. Uh, one of these that uh, has been submitted to the FDA is the trial by uh, Moderna, which is another RNA vaccine for the spike protein. And they also have reported, only in the press not published yet, 95% uh, efficacy without uh, severe adverse uh, events. Uh, so this is another extremely promising uh, vaccine that will be reviewed by the FDA, uh, I believe, next week. An inactivated uh, virus uh, developed uh, by Sinopharma in China ha has uh, recently completed a phase three clinical trial in uh, the United Arab uh, Emirates, uh, and the UAE reported the results of that uh, in the press uh, just uh, in the last couple of days, and they reported 86% efficacy from their trial although I have not seen details of the size of the trial or other details as to who was enrolled uh, in that trial, and we'll wait, await to see that. One of the most uh, widely anticipated uh, vaccines was the one from uh, Oxford uh, being developed by AstraZeneca, uh, which uh, has had several phase three trials uh, started. Uh, some have been completed. A fraction of uh, several of those have been uh, recently published just day before yesterday uh, in The Lancet. Uh, and that trial, which uh, showed the results from about 12,000 individuals, uh, reported 70% efficacy overall. Uh, unfortunately, there were two different regimens in their clinical trial uh, unwittingly. Uh, one where people got uh, uh, the standard dose uh, for both the first dose and the second dose, and that showed 60% uh, efficacy overall. But there was a subset which by a mistake the first dose was actually half strength of the adenovirus uh, vaccine. And these people uh, obtained 90% efficacy of the trial, even though they comprised a small fraction of uh, the overall trial, just about a quarter uh, of the population. Uh, and this subset had no patients over age 55. Uh, so it's quite difficult to evaluate uh, uh, whether this uh, should be recognized as uh, and registered as uh, a, a 
a useful treatment when it was not a uh, anticip was not an intended uh, goal of the trial to test this low dose followed by a higher dose. There are reasons to suspect that this might be an efficacious regimen because as I told you previously, when you deliver an adenovirus, the immune system might recognize it the second time around and you'll get less of a boost from the second dose. Uh, that, and it may be the case, it's possible but not certain, that the lower dose prevented such an, a, a robust immune response to the virus uh, and might work in the overall favor of vaccination. But that remains to be seen, and it remains to be seen whether uh, AstraZeneca will have to uh, repeat uh, uh, the uh, study. There's a 30,000 person study that is being enrolled in the United States uh, now, and it's anticipated that that may read out uh, in January. Uh, but this has been a very disappointing overall experience in the clinical trial. Uh, one, uh, despite the fact, fact that there's efficacy, but uh, it depends on what, uh, how, what the level of efficacy is, uh, because we now have two vaccines that uh, likely have approaching 95% efficacy uh, across a, a fairly broad uh, age and uh, ethnic distribution. Interestingly, uh, this uh, trial uh, looked for asymptomatic infections by testing a subset of people who had been enrolled. And it's quite striking that in contrast to the efficacy level that they were seeing uh, for uh, symptomatic infection, uh, they only saw 50% uh, uh, protection from uh, development of asymptomatic infection uh, in patients with this favorable low dose followed by uh, standard dose treatment and only 4% protection from people who received two doses uh, of, at the standard dose. So this raises the question of whether these vaccines may generally prevent severe infection, but may, may not be preventing uh, infection in the upper airway. And this may have implications for whether people who are uh, vaccinated will still be able uh, to spread the virus uh, into the future. Uh, as you may have heard, Project Warp Speed uh, is an effort uh, by the federal government to uh, ensure availability of the vaccine for use in the United States. Uh, they uh, have been aggressive about uh, securing these by promising to pay for effective virus, uh, effective vaccine before the clinical trials are completed. Uh, and uh, the, uh, they have a contract with Pfizer BioNTech for 100 million doses. 20 million of these will, uh, uh, be, uh, will likely be distributed uh, in 2020. Uh, that's the hope if it gets approved. Uh, there's another 500 million uh, with an unspecified delivery date. And Pfizer has uh, uh, announced uh, uh, that uh, uh, the US, uh, because we, we did not uh, as a country procure uh, delivery of these subsequent uh, uh, vac doses of vaccine, uh, that they've all been allocated until uh, June to other countries. Uh, and so this may be, we may get the 20 million uh, to begin with uh, that will vaccinate 10 million people because uh, this 20 million doses two per person, so that's 10 million people who will get it. Uh, and uh, perhaps altogether, we can vaccinate 50 million people with the Pfizer uh, vaccine before uh, the end of June. Uh, Moderna similarly will get uh, enough for 20 million, 20 million doses, 10 million in 2020, uh, likely if uh, this gets approved, and a total of 160 million uh, doses. Uh, and then we have other virus, uh, other vaccines lined up. Uh, the AstraZeneca virus is the one that uh, was being banked on uh, uh, at the highest level. Uh, and it's uh, a question as to what the future of uh, these other vaccines uh, will be. Uh, so uh, good news is we know that there are several uh, vaccines that uh, appear to have very high efficacy uh, uh, but it's a question mark at present uh, how the rest of these uh, uh, vaccines that are now in late stage clinical trials will fare. Uh, I, I'll simply mention, uh, as I have in prior uh, uh, of, uh, session, of these sessions, that there's been uh, a robust uh, uh, research effort across Rockefeller University uh, into COVID-19 in uh, its fundamental biology, uh, ways to prevent infection, ways to uh, treat infection. Uh, and I'll simply comment on uh, two recent uh, advances. 
One of these by Charlie Rice, who, uh, as I mentioned, received the Nobel Prize uh, uh, today for uh, his work on uh, the, the developing the cure for the hepatitis C virus. He's done uh, really uh, beautiful work in looking for host factors that uh, are necessary for the virus to complete its life cycle that are potential targets for therapeutics that would be unlikely to be mutated uh, and uh, lead to resistance to uh, uh, treatment the way the virus can mutate. And uh, papers that are coming out uh, shortly in the journal Cell uh, report on the results of these. One of these is a particularly interesting target uh, in that it appears to be necessary uh, for a wide variety of uh, coronaviruses uh, and might be something that is useful not just for COVID-19, but for future pandemics if we're able to target therapies uh, that are based on uh, that protein. Small molecule therapeutics may play a role in the future as well uh, and be necessary for people who have not responded to virus, uh, to uh, uh, vaccines. And uh, Tarun Kapoor and Tom Tushel uh, have both targeted essential proteins of the viral life cycle. Uh, Tarun has uh, made progress on the viral helicase, and Tom Tushel has uh, uh, targeted the viral methylase that caps the, five, the end of the viral RNA and protects the viral RNA from degradation. And this is uh, uh, the first uh, agent uh, working at this target uh, that uh, is, has now been uh, put into further development uh, uh, at the uh, Therapeutic Development Institute uh, shared by uh, Rockefeller, Sloan Kettering, and Weill Cornell. I'll stop sharing my screen and now uh, introduce uh, Michelle Nussenzweig, who will uh, give uh, this afternoon's presentation. Uh, Michelle is uh, known to you for he get, gave the first of uh, our uh, guest presentations in uh, this series, uh, and uh, we thought we'd bring him back for more because the project uh, has uh, made uh, spectacular progress uh, since uh, you last uh, heard from him. Uh, Michelle is uh, head of laboratory and professor here at uh, Rockefeller University. Uh, he's uh, highly honored for uh, his innovative research in uh, uh, the understanding the biology of the immune system broadly, and most recently uh, for his uh, development of methods that enable the cloning out of the genes that are producing any antibody of biologic interest that are being made by humans. He's a member of the uh, National Academy of Sciences. He's a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, uh, and he has received uh, every major award uh, awarded in the fields of uh, microbiology and immunology. So without further ado, I'll turn uh, the podium over to Michelle. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Rick. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, to be able to um, uh, share some of the work that we've been doing uh, on, on the coronavirus. The talk today is going to be in three parts. I'm going to um, just summarize uh, what we learned initially uh, from studying people that had been infected with the coronavirus. Uh, then I'm going to tell you something about uh, what happens after six months to the immunity and the people uh, that were infected, uh, whether it's lasting. Uh, and then I'm going to say something about uh, the development of antibodies that can be used um, as, as therapeutics uh, for this. So we started um, in April um, by recruiting people to Rockefeller uh, to give uh, samples that, that we could study uh, for uh, their immune responses. And um, I just want to summarize what we learned from studying their serum. Um, and that is that just about everybody was making antibodies to uh, the receptor binding domain. Uh, Rick went over that. That's the part of the uh, spike protein that interacts with the receptor on cells um, uh, that lets the virus get get into cells. So they had low levels of antibodies to, to this protein and low levels, relatively low levels of neutralizing activity, but just about everybody uh, had this. And we learned that antibodies had to cross-link uh, in order to neutralize the virus. What we learned from our clinical correlates of, of uh, studying these individuals is that uh, the neutralizing activity that people develop was dependent on their duration of symptoms or the severity of symptoms or age. All of those are codependent variables. People that are older or sicker longer 
they were exposed to the virus longer and they had more immunity to the virus because there was just more antigen, more virus uh, for the immune system to see. Men that were sicker longer than women <clears throat> also had uh, higher titers and hospitalized people, which again were sicker longer, also had uh, higher titers. By, um, we selected from these, um, this group of individuals with different neutralizing activities that's shown here. So one person had really high titers, but then you can see that there's quite a distribution. And this is just the first 60 and the others are even lower than this. So we selected some of these people for antibody cloning. And uh, the way we did this is, um, as Rick mentioned, uh, is, is from um, methods that we had developed here for studying other viruses, HIV, hepatitis B, Zika virus, and so on. And uh, what we do is we label uh, the uh, protein from the virus that is responsible for getting it into cells, and we ask for B lymphocytes uh, antibody producing cells in the blood that can actually bind to this protein specifically. And we can see that on a flow cytometry shown here, which allows us to isolate single cells that are making antibodies that actually can see the virus. And then we use molecular biology techniques to pull out the antibodies and reproduce them so we can test them uh, for whether they can uh, neutralize. And the focus, the, fo the bait that we use for this is the receptor binding domain. And this is a picture of the spike protein <clears throat> from the coronavirus. This is the receptor binding domain in red, and it's interacting with ACE2, which Rick mentioned is the cellular receptor for the virus. So this was the bait, and we used this bait because we understood that interfering with this reaction would potentially interfere with the entry of the virus into cells. All right, so what does this look like? Um, well, <clears throat> what you can see here is that people who have never been infected, the controls really don't have any lymphocytes in circulation that actually see that receptor binding domain. But every single individual that had been infected with the coronavirus had such cells. And we were able to clone um, several hundred antibodies from these people. Each one of these pie charts is, represents a person. The number in the middle is the number of antibodies that we clone. And the size of the slice uh, is the number of antibodies that are very, very closely related, a clone essentially, that has grown up in that individual that sees the virus. And the colors are antibodies that are very closely related. So these two people are making antibodies that are almost identical to each other. And you can see that colors are shared uh, by several of these people. So we are all solving this problem in, in similar ways. Now, in doing this, we were able to find uh, antibodies that were really very, very potent. And that's shown here. These experiments were done in Paul B. Nash's lab and Charlie Rice's lab. And what they show is that as these three antibodies, for example, neutralize the virus with IC, what we call IC50s, 50% neutralization at nanogram levels, so very low levels. Now, we were having these antibodies in hand, we could learn something about their mechanisms of action. And this is, these are experiments that we did in collaboration with Pamela Bjorkman's lab uh, at Caltech. And here's what we learned about how these things work. So uh, we have been able to categorize uh, four different types of neutralizing antibodies that see the virus and see the RBD in different ways. So this is one example, and this is the, in gray, the receptor binding domain. And what you can see here is that it's sitting up in a conformation that allows it to bind to ACE2, but the antibody is binding to precisely the region that ACE2 needs to interact with. So this antibody 
is blocking that interaction directly. This antibody is very similar to one of the antibodies in the Regeneron cocktail. Now, a second class of antibodies binds to not just one of the receptor binding domains on that S trimer, but also to its neighbor. So it's binding to, to two RBDs at the same time. And the way it does that uh, is that it has a long loop that sticks out, it's hydrophobic, and it sticks itself into a hydrophobic pocket in this neighboring receptor binding domain. Now, this class of antibody is different from the first one because what happens when it does this is it locks down the receptor binding domain in a configuration where it cannot bind to ACE2. So it blocks the interaction in two different ways. It blocks the interaction by binding to the ACE binding ridge, and it also blocks the interaction by preventing the receptor binding domain from sitting up and being able to interact with ACE2. So two different ways of blocking um, uh, the entry. A third class, and this is ACE2 here and the receptor binding domain here, a third class binds just below uh, where uh, ACE2 binds and interferes with entry indirectly. This class is similar <clears throat> to the class in the second antibody in the Regeneron cocktail. All right, so there are four classes and they're illustrated here. And what's important about this is that any given class of antibody may be susceptible to mutations that occur in the virus that make the virus um, not, no longer neutralizable by the antibody. But it would be very, very hard for the virus to make mutations that annul two together. And that's the concept in the Regeneron cocktail. It's also true for the antibodies that we have. So these are experiments that were done in Paul B. Nash's lab in collaboration on these antibodies that we cloned. Uh, and what he's doing here is taking a virus um, that is a highly mutable virus, um, inserting the spike protein into it, and then growing it up in the presence of antibody to see if we can find mutations that make the virus resistant to the antibody. Okay, and what you see here is the results of such an experiment. So if you grow the virus without any antibody, uh, it grows to a very, very high level. So this is 10 to the seventh, 10 to the eighth um, is, is, the, is, is the number of viruses that you get. Uh, if you grow it in any single antibody, even if they're very potent, the virus escapes. But if you combine two antibodies that see different sites, the virus can no longer escape. So are these antibodies any good for uh, therapies? Um, and we have tested them uh, in, in several different animal models. Uh, the most stringent animal model is the hamster model. Um, and we've tested these antibodies uh, using combinations just like the Regeneron cocktail, both in prophylaxis, so administering the antibodies before the infection or administering the antibody after the infection as a therapy. Okay, and here are the results. So these are plaque-forming units in the lung of... Uh, the hamster. And you can see here a million plaque forming units. And this is uh, in the controls. So this assay has a very huge dynamic range because you can detect as many as 10 uh, plaque forming units. So in the prevention experiment, what you see here is that very low levels of the combination of these two antibodies, as little as two milligrams per kilogram, are highly uh, protective. In therapy, uh, which is a harder bar, you can see that as little as 
four milligrams per kilogram is also highly protective. So these things are very, very effective, the antibody combination uh, that we in fact uh, have uh, developed. So what we've learned is that, you know, the human antibodies can select for resistant variants. These variants exist in nature already. We know that they're out there. Uh, the, the resistant mutations map to the antibody target sites, and antibody combinations targeting non-overlapping sites can protect against the emergence of resistant variants. Now, what I want to talk about now in the second part before I talk about the development of these antibodies uh, for clinical use is what happens to these people that were infected six months after their infection in terms of their responses, their immune responses. So here, what we're looking at uh, in this curve is uh, individuals that were assayed at one month after infection or six months after infection. The blue is one month and the red is six months. And these are their neutralizing titers. So you can see that just about everybody has dropped their neutralizing titers by an average of fivefold. But we can still see neutralization in serum in just about everybody. So that's, that's one piece of good news. A second piece of good news, um, perhaps even better, is the lymphocytes in the blood that carry the antibodies that could be called upon to remember the virus, to react again a second time. And what we find is that in every single individual, these cells are present. And not only are they present, but they seem to be increased with time. And we find that the antibodies in these people are developing and getting better with time. So these are um, two examples here. Um, the green is an antibody that came out after about a month. And the red is its brother, almost entirely identical with the exception of a few mutations, member of the same clone, but now this red antibody is much better than the green one. And in fact, it gets viruses <clears throat> in this panel to which the green antibody was completely unable to neutralize. So well, that's one example uh, and quite a dramatic change over the six months. Here's another example. This one, the green one, 144, is a really good antibody uh, to begin with, but there are some mutations which it just doesn't get. And its brothers here, uh, the blue and red, um, are really excellent antibodies that are nearly universal with very, very few mutations that can actually not be neutralized. So there's been quite an evolution of the antibody response in these people. In addition to the antibodies, we know that the T lymphocytes, um, which are also important uh, in um, both in, 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 in dealing with the infection, uh, are also uh, persisting. So we can see that here in these controls, this whole area of this plot is missing. These are the cells that react to the virus. And you can see that after a month, here they are. And after six months, there are fewer of them, but they are still there. So good news is that people that are infected are retaining their serum neutralizing activity after six months with a decrease. Um, this is similar, in fact, to what's being reported uh, for the Moderna uh, vaccine. Good news for Moderna vaccine and good news for people that have been infected. The memory B and T cells are persisting um, and the antibodies that are expressed by the memory B cells are improved. So what we're concluding is that immunity appears to be lasting after infection. This is something that people were very worried about, um, but I think it's all uh, quite good news. All right, so now let's talk just a little bit about 
what are the clinical uses of uh, antibodies? You know, we've heard um, about um, various individuals that have received uh, antibodies and also clinical trials that show that antibody administration early in infection is something uh, that keeps people out of hospitals. So antibodies really have two uses. Um, they have uh, the potential to be used for protection. And this would be in individuals that do not or cannot respond to the vaccine. For example, people that are undergoing cancer therapy or some form of immunotherapy. And there are a lot of, of these kinds of people. Their immune systems may simply not be able to react to the vaccine. The other category is for therapy. And these are people that would be infected uh, and they would be receiving antibodies to prevent uh, very severe outcomes. And this can also be a large group, including people that fail to respond, uh, have suboptimal responses, or people who, for whatever reason, fail to take the vaccine. And we may see quite a few of those people, unfortunately. All right, so what are the required clinical properties? Well, it has to be safe. The antibody has to be safe. It has to be potent. It has to have a long half-life if it's going to be used for both of those things. It has to be resistant to the escape mutations. And the route of administration is important. Right now, these things are being delivered intravenously, uh, which is, 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 is suboptimal. How do the antibodies, so the antibodies that we've cloned are being developed by uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb uh, in collaboration uh, with us. How do they compare to the antibodies that are out there? So this uh, column shows you the potency of the various antibodies, um, and these are just the published numbers. We've actually been able to make the Regeneron antibodies, so we know that these numbers are in fact accurate. Um, but the other ones are simply from publications. And you can see that our antibodies are really quite potent, uh, both of the antibodies that, that we will be using, uh, in fact, more potent than any of the ones that have been published. In addition to their potency, we've introduced mutations with increase the half-life of the antibodies. So these are very long-lasting. Uh, AstraZeneca has also introduced such mutations, but neither Regeneron nor Lilly have done so. Uh, the uh, mutation that was introduced by AstraZeneca is a little different from ours, and it uh, knocks out the effector function, uh, something that Rick mentioned, the tail end of the antibody. So this may not be particularly as effective as it should be uh, for therapy. The one that we have put in doesn't do that, and we expect it to be quite effective. Where are we in this process? Um, well, um, you know, we've done a lot of the discovery and um, preclinical testing. Uh, we've submitted uh, the investigational new drug uh, application to the FDA. We expect to hear from them uh, within uh, about 10 days. Um, Bristol Myers has uh, produced the antibodies um, for uh, clinical use to be able to take us through phase three and also potentially provide as many as 6 million vials of, of antibody uh, should the clinical trials uh, prove that, that these are, are useful. Um, and so what are we going to do? Um, well, the, the first uh, human safety uh, trial will be conducted here at Rockefeller uh, starting in, in January, early January. We expect it to be completed uh, by uh, mid-February. Uh, and at that time, we will enter into phase two, three uh, clinical uh, activity uh, with so-called active two trial um, with, uh, with the NIH. We're also considering uh, additional trials, small cl clinical trials, uh, in particular for people that are uh, immunodeficient um, and uh, would be unable uh, to uh, respond to the vaccine. And those would be both protection and therapy trials. And we're expecting to have an emergency use authorization uh, sometime around May or June. So, um, just want to summarize that um, uh, the Rockefeller Hospital and the clinical group headed by Marina Kasky um, 
were instrumental in bringing us um, these individuals. And these people, the volunteers, were also uh, incredible in coming forward uh, both after, uh, shortly after their infection resolved and now returning to Rockefeller for further studies. Uh, studying these people uh, has um, revealed uh, something about their immune responses uh, and the evolution of their immune responses uh, after infection and has provided us with antibodies uh, that are what that we hope to be clinically useful, but also have taught us a lot about how the immune system is protecting uh, us against uh, this disease. Um, I want to uh, really highlight the fact that um, we would not be able to do this uh, without a tremendous support um, from um, a variety of, of individuals and foundations. Um, and I want to particularly highlight the, the Robertson uh, Development Fund and uh, Pablo and Almadena Ligoretta, um, who've really contributed uh, tremendously uh, to this effort, um, along with a, a large number of foundations and other individuals. Um, of course, this is something that isn't done in, in a single laboratory, but it's done uh, in many laboratories. Um, and uh, something that we've all been doing together. Uh, in my lab, I just want to highlight uh, that there are many, many individuals uh, that have been uh, involved in this. Um, in uh, Marina Kasky's uh, clinical group, um, uh, Christian Gabler uh, has been very much involved, and Jill Horowitz in coordinating uh, what we've been doing uh, with uh, Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh, and other industrial partners. Um, here at Rockefeller, the BNASH lab and the Rice lab uh, have been deeply involved in all of this. I wouldn't be able to do it without them. Um, and uh, at Caltech, uh, Pamela Bjorkman's lab uh, has, has led, uh, led us uh, in terms of understanding uh, how these antibodies work. Um, with that, I'll, I'll stop sharing and, and happy to, to take questions. Thank you, Michelle, that was terrific. So uh, I want to thank everyone who has uh, submitted questions. We'll get through as many as uh, we can before uh, terminating and, and ending uh, today's session. Uh, there were, have been a number of questions about uh, the difference between systemic and mucosal immunity. What's your expectation as to whether uh, IgG, which is made uh, systemically in response to uh, vaccines, uh, will be effective at, uh, in preventing the upper airways infections that uh, uh, start the infectious process? Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's a question of how much um, IgG there is and how much is going to leak into the mucosa. Um, it, um, the IgG will be less effective, likely, in preventing uh, the uh, upper airway um, virus infection uh, than it is in um, helping with uh, more severe uh, problems. And does that uh, have implications for whether we're going to continue to need to wear masks even after vaccination? I will. <laughs> um, Are there ways to uh, target uh, mucosal immunity specifically, an intranasal application, for example? Yeah, you know, there are uh, intranasal applications, and uh, they do raise uh, IgA antibodies. And there's some data that they may be more effective. Um, so I think this is something that we're going to see uh, coming down the pike uh, a little bit later on. What's the, uh, uh, the data on the efficacy of uh, these antibodies to uh, have an impact on severe disease once severe disease is established? Yeah, that's unlikely, uh, Rick. Once people are really sick, uh, intubated and so on, uh, that the antibodies are, are it's going to be too late, uh, mo most likely. Um, the antibodies are going to be most effective for people who are recently diagnosed. So if, uh, if, if, you, if you go to your doctor's office or if you take a home uh, kit test uh, and you turn out to be positive, um, and you can get a subcutaneous injection of antibody, uh, this is very likely to keep you out of the hospital. 
Uh, so this is where they're going to be most useful in terms of therapies. Given that uh, so many uh, deaths occur in uh, long-term care facilities, uh, it raises the question, you know, these were not, these patients, individuals were not studied uh, to my knowledge in any of uh, the clinical trials, uh, raising the question, you know, we say, well, everybody mounts an immune response but we don't, I don't know if the people who are most likely to die from uh, COVID infection uh, are capable of mounting an immune response. Uh, is there any data on uh, this population? You know, not that I know of, Rick. Um, and it, it, it's most likely that uh, even if they do respond, that their responses will be somewhat lower and degrade faster. So those people um, could be excellent candidates for uh, an antibody uh, prevention, uh, a long-term a long -term antibody prevention. With the uh, mutations that you've engineered into your antibodies, what's your guess as to how, how often would you need to get uh, a shot of the antibody to get long-term uh, uh, protection? Uh, yeah, it would depend on how it's delivered. So um, I'm making my guesses based on what we know from the HIV antibodies that carry the same mutations. Uh, if it's delivered intravenously, it would be, we think, between nine months and a year, uh, once a year or once every nine months. Uh, if it's delivered subcutaneously, we think it'll be every three months or so. And based on the data that uh, uh, you have of the persistence of uh, the memory B cells, uh, this seems like uh, potentially good news for the vaccines and the uh, durability of the vaccines as well. Do you have uh, speculation on that? Um, I don't have much speculation on that, Rick, but we will know, we will have data on that um, within a month. Okay. So we've had a spectacular number of uh, good questions that have come in. Uh, one, just to start, is uh, someone has asked whether uh, your spleen is necessary to develop memory B cells. And so if you don't have uh, a spleen, are you unlikely to respond to the vaccine or to have long-term protection? No, I think you will respond to the vaccine without a spleen. Uh, the spleen is most important for clearing uh, bacteria. Uh, people who don't have spleens, uh, you know, have terrible bacterial infections, but they do respond to vaccination. Another question is uh, whether the monoclonal antibody therapies uh, have any role in instructing the immune system uh, how to respond, uh, and, or whether they're simply inert with the rest of the immune system, uh, and when they go away, all the protection goes away. Well, they can be instructive um, if the antibody and the virus are present at the same time. Uh, they not directly instructive, but what they can do is they can help the immune system see the virus uh, and boost immunity. What do you think about, uh, you know, just from a public health standpoint, you made the uh, point that it's important for people to get treated very early uh, for the antibodies uh, to have their best chance to uh, prevent development of severe infection. And most patients are finding it hard to get tested uh, uh, quickly and may be unlikely to be uh, going out and seeking testing until they're relatively far along in their infectious course. Do you have yeah. a guess as to how many days into infection uh, would be uh, not just optimum, but likely to have benefit? I don't, Rick, but I, I think it's going to be something like a week. Uh, you know, I don't know that for sure, but based on the hamster, the monkey, and the mouse studies, probably about a week. Another question is about the uh, challenges in biomanufacture of uh, antibodies compared to uh, the vaccines. What's, uh, uh, you mentioned 6 million uh, vials for yeah, your vaccine. Yeah, so that's, that's 6 million is a drop in the bucket. Uh, and, um, you know, this is a real problem. None of the companies that are making these antibodies um, have sufficient ability to produce antibodies to cover everything. Uh, so even though there are doses of antibodies out there, it's, it's certainly not enough. Um, nobody's going to be able to produce enough. 
There's a question that uh, has come in uh, regarding if if you got the vaccine and still ended up uh, getting infection, would there be any concern about uh, giving uh, antibody therapy to uh, such a patient? I wouldn't. I, I think uh, I would not have a concern about that. Do uh, Given the recent, uh, what, what do you make of the uh, uh, AstraZeneca trial? Do you have uh, thoughts as to why this low dose, high dose uh, might have worked? Or do you think that's a, uh, might be just a chance event in a small number, a relatively small number of patients? How's, how's think, the field viewing uh, this trial? I think you, Rick, uh, said it beautifully um, that uh, it's possible that uh, you know, there wasn't enough uh, of a response the first time through. But the other explanation is that this was a small number of people um, and it's just a fluke. Yeah. Do um, a question is, uh, is, is stimulating antibodies eventually a hazard? Is there a limit to uh, the amount of time your body wants to be making uh, antibodies or having them around? No, um, no, I, I, I no, the answer is no. And how about uh, treatment with anti-inflammatories uh, in the course of disease? Uh, obviously, uh, uh, glucocorticoids uh, have uh, proven to be of benefit uh, in patients with serious infection. Uh, do we know whether that impairs development of uh, long-lasting immunity? I don't think we know that. And the benefits of um, steroids are really uh, very late. Uh, people who are you know, just getting intubated uh, before they're in, in the earlier stages, it's really not a good idea to give steroids for precisely the reason that you said, which is that they can interfere uh, with the development of immunity. So uh, another question is, uh, if you had your druthers, would you rather have a vaccine or an antibody therapeutic? Well, you know, the antibodies are... Um, there's, they have a very good safety profile. So personally, if I could get an antibody and not have to get it again for a very, very long time, I might prefer that. Another question is uh, whether um, the vaccines can be therapeutic in uh, any patients or whether it's strictly preventive. I think that you should think of them as preventive. Uh, if, you're, if you're sick, uh, you should get the antibody. Uh, let's see, other questions. Uh, here's a, a very practical question. Are you uh, going out to eat in uh, restaurants indoors uh, this winter? No way, no <laughs> way. Uh, you know, that's a really bad idea. Um, uh, I think um, you know, as much as we all love to go to restaurants and I am particularly love going to restaurants, really haven't and won't uh, until, until things are really m much more under control. And especially now, I think Rick, you, you, you put it you know, really well in, in your introduction that we're seeing a real problem here, uh, a problem that's as bad as, as, as March basically. Uh, and, and we all have to essentially raise our level of um, just caution. You bet. Um, another question is, uh, again, from a practical standpoint, uh, how concerned should we be about uh, the fact that the vaccine, for example, uh, this first one coming through from uh, Pfizer, uh, has uh, the trial had uh, about 18,000 people in the vaccinated uh, arm. Is that enough to understand uh, the risk profile in its totality? And if not, should, uh, would it be prudent to wait until there's more experience to get uh, the, uh, the vaccine? How do you feel about uh, uh, getting the vaccine uh, once it's available? Yeah, I think that by the time it's available for most of us, uh, we will have a lot more data. So by February or March, um, we'll know a lot more about um, how safe it is, how long lasting it is, uh, and uh, assuming that it it stays, you know that 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 it stays great, I would take it for sure. Yes. 
Do uh, you see any role for uh, the antibodies potentially uh, being used in combination with uh, other therapies such as remdesivir? Yes, and in fact, that's something that um, we are testing. Great. Well, we've gone uh, beyond the hour, and uh, we could go on for quite some time with uh, questions, but uh, in the interest of uh, the rest of everyone's uh, evening, I think we should uh, draw this to a close. Uh, Michelle, I want to thank you again for an absolutely spectacular presentation of your really groundbreaking work. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that uh, the depth of your work has led to what uh, I suspect will be best-in-class uh, antibodies uh, that uh, nobody else has uh, come close to yet uh, in their potency. Uh, and uh, moreover, that uh, the instructive work that you've shown on uh, what is and isn't possible in developing resistance and how these antibodies mechanistically work, uh, I think is just profound and really uh, sets the stage for uh, the rest of the field. So thank you and uh, congratulations. Thank you. I, I, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, present the work. A real pleasure. And to uh, all of you uh, in the audience, I'm sorry that we weren't able to answer uh, all of the questions, uh, but we got through a large number of them and uh, they were a spectacularly good group of uh, questions. Thank you so much for your interest and participation. Uh, and thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, we are very proud of the COVID-19 research going on here at Rockefeller. Uh, we've been able to accelerate this work owing to uh, the incredible generosity uh, of our benefactors. Uh, and uh, the following slide as we close out, uh, will show if you would like to, uh, how you can make a contribution uh, to this effort. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon uh, and all best wishes for a good evening and beyond.